Okay. Um, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's uh, talk on climate smart agriculture um, with Feed the Future activities. Uh, our today's speaker is going to be Rob Bertram, our chief scientist for the Bureau for Food Security. Um, joining us also and acting as our uh, experts on various um, areas within climate smart agriculture and answering questions as well is uh, Mofat Ngugi, uh, Mark Fasaki, Tatiana Polito, and Lars Schrieg. Uh, so they'll be jumping in and answering questions after Rob gives his uh, presentation. So as you have questions, please enter them into the chat box and we will be uh, tracking those and um, trying to answer as many as possible during this session. Uh, and so uh, please use the chat box uh, whenever you have a question. Uh, we're going to pass it over to uh, Rob. Okay, good morning everyone, or and whatever time of day it is, greetings. And um, I'm delighted to be here with uh, our whole, uh, many parts of our Climate Smart Agriculture team from the Bureau for Food Security. I'm going to be talking today about Climate Smart Agriculture in Feed the Future, and I thought it would be useful to start with a little overview of Feed the Future to set the context for our approach to Climate Smart Agriculture. Having said that, I think that many of the things that we'll be talking about this morning are relevant in many instances and situations and contexts beyond Feed the Future as well, so I hope it'll be widely uh, uh, useful. Uh, finally, I hope that by the end of the discussion, we will have conveyed that, feed, that climate smart agriculture is fully consistent and aligned with our goals in food security. Okay, uh, I'm gonna start with a slide from Mark Sadler at the World Bank drawing on some work from the uh, Climate Change Agriculture and Food Security Program, CCAFs of the CGIR. And this is just to help us all recall that the, the, the larger challenge when we look ahead to feeding the world and where we're going to be at mid-century with nine or 10 billion people. So this, of course, is going to require things you've heard before, a 70% increase in production of food. Uh, at the same time, we're looking at major climate challenges as well as challenges around competition for land resources, water resources, and other factors. Um, but when we look ahead to meeting that kind of challenge, I think we have to remember something It made me think of the line in The Wizard of Oz when the Scarecrow says to Dorothy, it's always best to start at the beginning. And that's what we have to do. We have to start with uh, the, the, the situation we have now. Uh, and frankly, the, the money that we get from the Congress to invest in food security is predicated on making progress in the near term, impacts on hunger, poverty, and child stunting. So I'd like you to try to hold on to these two ideas. On the one hand, trying to make impacts now in the near term, but also putting us in the right trajectory to meet the challenges facing the world in the long term. Now a little bit about how we work in Feed the Future. You can see the, the key points here, the fact that we, we follow the lead of our partner countries, the part that we very much focus on integrating nutrition and agriculture, on gender, on accountability, and I'm delighted that Tatiana Polito is here with us today because she is uh, a leader in our effort to uh, demonstrate to the investors, Congress in particular, but to the American people more broadly, that these investments are really paying off. And I also um, want to focus on the fact that we use a smallholder approach, where we're looking to uh, transform agricultural systems where hundreds of millions of smallholder families live across the developing world. Now, a little bit on what we do. Um, you can see here the, 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 the important elements of Feed the Future. What I'd like to add to this slide is that we have what we call three cross-cutting issues. One is gender, the second is environment, sustainability, and the third is climate change. 
And um, in terms of climate change, if we go back to the original guide to Feed the Future in 2010, uh, we can see that there's a, a very good discussion of both adaptation and mitigation. But I must tell you that in the early years, uh, it was really an adaptation focus that I think predominated. And I think that, that you're going to see as we go along why that would be the case. Um, also, very important to remind us all what our metrics are at the end of the day. In other words, what, looks, what does success look like? It looks like reductions in poverty and reductions in stunting. So this is a, these are very important uh, focusing objectives for the entire initiative. And then in terms of poverty, I just want to remind you all that we have continuing evidence of agricultural growth being more than twice as effective as other kinds of economic growth in reducing poverty. And the poorer a country is, the, the more effective and important agricultural growth is to meeting our poverty reduction objectives. Now, the second main goal that I mentioned was child stunting. And this uh, is, uh, I wanted to <clears throat> give you a little bit more on that because it's Frankly, as an agriculturalist, it's very daunting. It's a high bar. So we need to kind of break it down. And what we see here is that food accounts for about a third of what we need to address the stunting problem. In addition, water and sanitation play a critical role. And then very importantly, women's education and status. So it's all three of these things have to come together to, to meet that objective. The other thing I'd like you to notice is that within the food section, there's two things. There's the dietary energy supply. There's also the amount of energy from non-staples. So this has major implications for our approach in terms of driving diet quality improvement. Um, a little bit more on sustainable intensification. You can see here the, the main elements. And as I said, we have this focus on smallholder productivity gains and smallholder-led agricultural transformation. So when I think about sustainable intensification, I think about reducing risk, increasing productivity, fostering investment because of those two things, and investment everywhere, on-farm, off-farm, in the, in the government sector, and very importantly, in the private sector. We think about the natural resource management context, the policy and human capital context. And I think while we see sustainable intensification as being critical at the micro level, at the farm and community level, it's also, I would argue, critical at a global macro level as well. And the next slide gives you a, a little bit more on why I say this. We have two different development pathways that have been followed in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And globally speaking, these are the two hot spots of food insecurity and child stunting and poverty. Um, not to say there aren't other hot pockets, but these are the largest sections. What you can see here is that in South Asia, we have seen the intensification of agriculture via productivity growth that has driven incomes increase, productivity increase, and poverty reduction for hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people. In sub-Saharan Africa, it's a, been a different trajectory that has included more, it's more growth in production has resulted from an extensification. And this is bringing more land under the plow, um, and, and uh, it, it has not led to the kinds of gains in terms of poverty reduction and, and, and that we are seeking and what we have seen in other parts of the world. So we really very much want to uh, help drive this, um, in particular, as I mentioned before, by reducing risk so that there's greater incentive to invest. And this includes climate risk. So we can think about things like information. It's incredibly important to sustainable intensification. And that information could be about weather, and climate and other things that help farmers adapt. Now, climate smart agriculture has introduced the, um, third, the, the mitigation concept, in other words, the reduction of greenhouse gases. And um, this has been developing for a number of years. As I said, it was anticipated in, the, in 2010. 
but uh, it got a formal launch at the UN General Assembly uh, in 2014. Um, many countries joined together with international organizations. And I think many of you have heard by now about the triple win concept, which is the idea that we have three pillars, the productivity and income and food security dimensions in a classical sense, increased adaptation to climate change, the ability to withstand it, and then very importantly, the third pillar, which is reduce, reducing the greenhouse gas footprint. FAO says where possible, other groups like USAID have concluded that where appropriate. I frankly think that it's that that's less of an issue in terms of the terminology because what we want to do, and I think you're going to see this over the course of the discussion, we want to try to, to reduce greenhouse gas from business as usual. In other words, we want to try to bend the curve so that the Im intensity of emissions per unit productivity is reduced. Um, there are other instances where we can even go beyond that, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those. Um, in terms of uh, the implications, in the developed countries, a lot of the attention to climate smart agriculture has been on the mitigation side. In the less developed countries, where farmers tend not to benefit from as many uh, things that help uh, increase their resilience to weather shocks, uh, adaptation uh, has has probably predominated. But I think you're going to see that really the two can very nicely go together. Oops, sorry. There we go. Um, now, uh, uh, this week, I think we have, uh, hopefully you, uh, you have access to the framework paper. This is something that's been uh, under development for over a year. Um, it's about the how we are seeing climate smart agriculture in Feed the Future. And as I said, it, you, uh, it's very aligned with Feed the Future's goals. And you can see we've broken down five areas. Um, I want to also just mention how much review this paper got inside AID from our missions and then um, across the US government. And then, very importantly, from our external stakeholder community. And I want to say a little bit about the feedback we got from, from all of you. Um, one was that we keep poverty and nutrition uppermost in our objective. And that's, frankly, right in the middle of the Feed the Future uh, money that is appropriated by the Congress. But, but that was a message from all of you as well. Also, the very important point about being farmer-centric and smallholder inclusiveness, and very much the uh, highlighting the importance of enabling smallholder decision-making. And I think the third piece that then follows right from that is that we focus our efforts on providing information, better information to farmers, and also more in the way of choice. And finally, a fourth point that, that uh, I think I read across a wide range of commenters was that we have to think of this as an enhancement of current practice, not a replacement. In other words, this is something that's evolving. And, and again, what we're seeing is that indeed many dimensions that we would now call climate smart were being adopted and, and extended well before we actually used that terminology. Um, so um, we want to then focus on uh, to move from the framework paper, which I hope you'll all read, and, and we continue to welcome uh, your, your, your ideas about it, to how do we strengthen climate smart agriculture in Feed the Future, across Feed the Future. And I want to say a little bit about something we call Global Learning and Evidence Exchange, the GLEE. And we are going to have several of these. These are focused, they're designed to help support our, our missions in terms of uh, giving them uh, additional information, tools, and understanding of how to best approach climate smart agriculture in their food uh, security portfolios. But um, I don't despair if you're not going to be part of, of these uh, glees as we develop them because we are going to also develop a climate smart agriculture course that reflects on the GLEE 
uh, what, what goes into the glee, and then we'll find other ways to share the kinds of learning and approaches that we think are appropriate. So I wanted to run with you today a little bit about um, uh, what the glee is going to include, because I think it basically will signal to you what we think are the important considerations for any of us as we contemplate um, investments in agriculture and food security. Uh, one is this policy context, which is uh, very important, uh, and it, it, there's a regional one, very prominent in Africa, other parts of the world, but there's also global context, the Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture. There's also the issue of what is the climate science telling us, uh, and that we, will, we are going to work with some of the best expertise available to try to discern what information we know about uh, trends in, in, in weather that have changed over time, about what we look forward to, um, about uh, increasing uncertainty of things like rainfall and seasonality, uh, increased uh, extreme events, uh, storms and such, along coastal areas, saltwater intrusion. So these kinds of things we'll, we'll, we'll be learning together. Then I think more Fundamentally, also to introduce the idea that we think of climate smart agriculture as an approach. It's not a checklist. It's not a, um, you know, this technology is climate smart, this is not, that kind of thing. It's, it's more an approach, at, and it needs to be integrated across the whole portfolio. And, and, and we need to think about it just as we do really think about, say, gender in everything we do. Um, and then how to work with and integrate climate services. There's a lot of investment going on, including from our colleagues in, in the Global Climate Change Initiative in USAID and other government agencies and, and many other partners on climate services, on weather information, on other kinds of things that can help farmers uh, anticipate and adapt. Uh, vulnerability assessments. Again, lots of investment, a range of um, uh, a focus on them how to use them. Uh, we're not going to try to duplicate the kinds of training that go on in the climate change community, but we want to help food security uh, practitioners and agriculturalists and nutritionists be smart consumers of these, uh, these, these uh, resources. And then a lower emissions development. And we're going to look, and I'll have some uh, uh, examples for you, of opportunities for absolute reduction, the triple win, in terms of the, in one way, uh, in some instances, and in other instances, the triple win looking really more like bending the curve, uh, as even though overall emissions are going up, the emissions per unit production are going down. We'll say more about that as well. I also want to just mention that the E3 Bureau and the Africa Bureau are active partners in the design and, and implementation of the GLEE, and we really appreciate all the assistance they have provided because many of the things we need are coming from our colleagues in the climate uh, change uh, area of, of USAID and, and elsewhere. And then a little bit more, um, we're, we're, we have done working with CCAFs, the CGIR program I mentioned, portfolio assessments. We're going to be looking for shared lessons that missions can share with each other and learn from each other's experience. We recognize that some of our missions work in similar environments and, and situations. Others are in very different situations, so there's a lot of opportunity there. We're going to be thinking about the technical considerations, the systems perspective and natural resource management. And it's great that Mofat and Gugi is here this morning because Mofat is really uh, our thought leader in that area. Uh, we have component technologies. Um, and the whole issue of, of, of scaling, and Laura Schreg is, is here, and she'll be speaking to those. Uh, she's very active in that area. And expanding farmer choice, the, 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 this issue of um, giving farmers more options. One of the points I made that I said came from our, uh, our uh, stakeholder group in, in the review of the paper. Partnerships, very is important issue, uh, very much with Trying to trying to incentivize the the private sector and the public sector, the NGOs, but especially the private sector, those private goods, how to incentivize them to adopt climate smart approaches. And I think the really exciting thing we see there is how congruent climate smart approaches are to 
profitability uh, for the private sector. So that's very exciting. And then um, we want to support our missions in helping them operationalize climate smart agriculture approaches, how to access and use the knowledge and tools and resources that are available across AID and beyond. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll be discussing this issue of accountability, as we spoke about it earlier. That's one of the hallmarks of Feed the Future, and Tatiana has been leading uh, the charge here in terms of uh, determining how we can use our monitoring system, which has been in place for a number of years now, and which, you know, in a sense has to evolve slowly because projects are designed and, and, and certain metrics are built in, but we're trying to think about, well, what are the ways we can use the information we have? In addition, what other opportunities for new kinds of information can give us insights about the adoption uh, and results from climate smart agriculture? So um, very importantly, I. I think one of the things I really want to drive home today is that a lot of what we see in CSA and in sustainable intensification more broadly is information intensive. And, and it, there are things we can use and provide farmers to, to allow them to, um, to uh, get, gain in terms of uh, the climate smartness of their system, increase their adaptation, potentially also increase the uh, uh, sequestration of carbon and soil organic matter or other kinds of biomass. And we have, um, what we also see is that this is wholly consistent with diversification. You can see some, up, some examples here on the slide. Um, it does require better information. It, it also is very critical. This is, it's also aligned with a risk reduction effort and a resource use efficiency approach, which is one of the hallmarks both of sustainable intensification but also of climate smart agriculture. And then I think what we really see so often is co-adaptation, mitigation and adaptation coming together. And you can see that in the slide where we're increasing the organic matter, we're increasing the soil hold, moisture holding capacity, the water use efficiency, the nutrient uh, use efficiency, and importantly, we're integrating things like livestock and fish and poultry that help achieve our food security objectives um, in terms of income, diet quality, et cetera. Well, there's lots of opportunities there as well. Um, our, our, our colleagues working on lower emissions development have told us that just by improving feed quality for ruminants, we can greatly reduce the greenhouse gas uh, we can really bend that curve in terms of both increasing their productivity but also reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, per unit of production, which at this point, for example, in Africa is extremely high, but that we can change that. Um, now I want to take this down to the, the level of real people and real situations. And some of this work predates uh, what we call climate smart agriculture, but the concepts are there and we can still learn from them and, and they're very, very relevant in a climate smart context. So this is a, a woman named Rhoda in Malawi. She only had a, a hectare or so of land um, and her yields some 20 years ago were, were almost, I mean, almost starvation, a couple bags of maize from her land. And what she did was, this is now a picture now, and it's a very different picture, as you can see. She's got a nice maize crop, and she's got trees. At the beginning, she had bare land. And what she did was she used a system of doubled up uh, groundnut and pigeon pea production, which added nitrogen to the soil. It's a very climate smart approach to increasing soil fertility. It also, because of the organic matter that was being added, made her fertilizer much more effective when she added fertilizer for the nutrients that were not, not there from just the, the biological nitrogen fixation alone. And um, so soil organic matter went up. She integrated fertilizer trees, um, different species of leguminous trees, which added a lot of biomass into her production system. And she went from two bags of maize to 50 bags of maize. So what does that mean? Well, it means that calorie-wise, her family was much better off, but it also allowed her to diversify. 
and she started uh, uh, growing pigs and, and feed them uh, from her corn, her excess corn, but also from the biomass from the trees and, and, and other fodder. And uh, it's really been transformative. Um, and, and so we have a system in which much more carbon is being sequestered. She's got a much higher income. Her children are, have school fees, and she has much more in the way. She built a house even. Uh, it's really a, a terrific story, and very importantly, she's much more resilient to shocks. This is, uh, you know, she so she's increased her adaptative capacity as well, to especially to climate shocks. And so, what we're doing with all of this kind of experience is we're we're working hard in the main agro ecosystems in which we work to apply the science here in a, a range of systems. Uh, recognizing that farmers are going to make very different decisions based on where they are, and we call that we have a program called Africa Rising, and that's research in sustainable intensification for the next generation, and it is, I would say, wholly consistent with a climate smart approach, and it looks at all the things I talked about, but this is the kind of thing that we're learning from and trying to understand that process so that more people like Rhoda can can benefit. Now. Having said that, there's still some great challenges out there that we face. Um, smallholder agriculture, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, is is undercapitalized, and and you know we need to think about. We remember we talked about reducing risk. We also want to reduce drudgery, and 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 the the. hard labor, bird um, we need to do this kind of thing, bringing in irrigation and mechanization through a smallholder, looking in things that can help aggregate supply and demand for smallholders so that markets are more attractive, uh, both to them, but very importantly to, to private investors and, 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 and the, the linking them to value chains. Uh, the role of farmer organizations, there's ways to spread the risk around capitalization, um, and the role of the private sector and the public sector. So now in Asia, it's, it's a bit of a different story. This is a picture from Asia, as you can see. But in sub-Saharan Africa, we're very much focused on trying to get this next stage of transformation, which may increase overall emissions, but it will... From what we know, it will greatly reduce emissions intensity. In other words, emissions, greenhouse gas per unit productivity. So let's take a look, though, at another system in South Asia, in the Indo-Gangetic Plains. Um, we have a program that we co-fund with the Gates Foundation. It's a serial systems initiative for South Asia. And when we first designed this more than 10 years ago, the whole focus was on climate resilience. But it also had a big part of it soil and water conservation. It brought in heat tolerant crops. Heat toler early onset of heat is a huge problem in South Asia. We integrated things like fish ponds. There was a, a tremendous amount of farmer experimentation and uh, things like, and then new tech approaches like deep placement urea that made fertilizer. Not only could you use less, what you used was much more effective. And of course, what we have gotten here, as you can see, is productivity increases big savings in energy by reducing the amount of irrigation water pumped, by reducing the, the, to moving to a no-till or, or a reduced till system, um, and then big increases in profitability. So it's a beautiful example of a triple win that is really around absolute reduction. So this is an already intensified system that we that supports you know a, a billion people or so, but they're through, through science and technology and sound policy, we can bring in uh, approaches that really make it a lot clim more climate smart uh, than uh, maybe it would have been otherwise. Um, now, a little bit about science in these smallholder systems. So um, I, I wanted to talk about, for example, we can think about uh, nitrogen use efficiency. This is, these, these are things we're working on in Feed the Future have big implications for uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and fertilizer, reduced fertilizer use and higher effectiveness. We can look at the issue of water use efficiency and the ability of the system to store more water 
and, and but we can actually do the biology that helps drive that as well. So it's a combination of agronomy uh, and good information and on pests and weather and other things combined with uh, new science opportunities. Opportunities for reduced tillage that further increase the water penetration from rainfall and the water use efficiency also uh, um, uh, increase the organic matter in the soil. Um, nutritional quality is another possibility. And then uh, tolerance to higher temperatures that I've already talked about and improve photosynthetic efficiency. And I wanted to give you an example of, of one of the things that has been such a challenge all along, but is becoming more so in, as climate change. And we've seen this in Southern Africa. We're seeing it now with El Nino. That's a, a different discussion. But in Southern Africa last year, we saw the effects of mid-season drought. And this is, has a terrible impact. And it also, if the maize crop is threatened, it makes people more and more risk averse and less willing to invest and less, less willing to diversify because they want to make sure they have enough maize to eat. So we've developed with working with CIMIT, um, uh, uh, low, um, sorry, I want to go back one second. There we go. Uh, the stress tolerant maize, and this has been going on for many years. And we have really, you can see the example there of this drought tolerant on the left versus the uh, drought susceptible normal varieties grown on the right. So there's huge impacts coming from that. But then with the new science, we are also getting, making progress, really unbelievable progress in my opinion, on heat tolerance. And you can see here, this is from a partnership, public, private, um, and developed country uh, partners uh, uh, developing uh, heat tolerant maize for Asia. Uh, and you can see it's just a dazzling uh, progress. And it was made in about three years. In other words, they're outperforming the best local materials in just a short time. So the, the, the high temperature threat is re very real, as we know, in climate change. Um, and the, so here's a, a good example of adaptation. But it can be adopted in systems that are very much focused on mitigation as well. So that's it's a very uh, nice uh, uh, example. One other thing is this issue of scale. And coming back to the stress tolerant maize in Africa, um, we put a lot of effort in Feed the Future towards transformation of scale. You know, we don't just measure our success by how our projects look. We have population-based indicators, and so we have to really move the needle for everybody. So here's an example where we now have about um, 5 million households, but the goal is much higher, and Laura Schrag is uh, very actively involved with this. Some of you know John McMurdy. He's left USAID, but he was deserves a lot of credit, and, and Mark Heisinger from our Markets Partnerships and Information Office, very, uh, uh, and um, Innovation Office, very involved with that. So again, um, we want to reduce risk, increase productivity, and help potentiate and drive diversification among smallholders. Now, very importantly, this doesn't happen without a seed system being in place. And this is, I think, very central to where we can go in terms of giving farmers choices. We know with climate change that both abiotic, things like drought and heat, and Temp you know, temperature, that sort of thing, that kind of stress is going to change more rapidly than ever before. But we also expect that pests and diseases will change more rapidly than ever before. So we've got to be able to develop but also deploy diversity and give farmers choices, whether it's in the same crop, for example, the stress tolerant or heat tolerant maize, or a new crop. Maybe they'll shift to short sorghum. Maybe they move from bean to groundnut maybe the other direction. But those seed systems are generally not there. And the average age of varieties in places like Sub-Saharan Africa is 20 or 25 years. We've got to change that. And I hope USAID is going to be at the vanguard of a global partnership with African partners, the private sector, the public sector, and traditional seed systems. It's not all, I mean, it's, it, we, we really can be very strategic. And there's a lot of people thinking about this. But I, I, I really feel that it's an absolute essential thing for us to try to deliver in the context of climate smart agriculture. Now, wrapping up here, I want to make 
clear, we've been talking a lot about what happens on farm. It's not only what happens on farm, it's also what happens after the farm. And we, we very much, you know, we take up what we call a value chain approach in Feed the Future. Missions invest in ways that help connect smallholders to markets and that incentivize investment all along that value chain from farm to fork. Um, so we're thinking about what we can do to, uh, to, to strengthen the climate smartness of these value chains. So we can think about input markets, many opportunities around water use efficiency and ir small scale irrigation. Uh, we can reduce post-harvest losses. This has huge ramifications for both mitigation and adaptation because it also reduces the need for additional produ production uh, and adds value. Um, market efficiency, getting farmers better information, that can help, that can make markets much more effective and help reduce losses, help farmers increase their incomes. Drying and processing innovations. This is just one example of an energy intensive part of the agricultural value chain. We can look for ways to be more innovative, solar dryers, um, other kinds of approaches that, um, that um, enhance uh, how, uh, how product is stored or processed. And also policy around things like trade. How, how much time do trucks spend at borders full of food with the food wasting or spoiling and, and their trucks running and burning fuel? So we, you know, there's lots of ways that we can think climate smart and we're really trying to be quite holistic in, 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 in looking for all those opportunities. And I really want to thank my colleagues in the Mar Market Partnership and Innovations Office. Kurt Rensma is not here this week, otherwise he'd be with us this morning. Many of you know Kurt. He has led an effort with Mark Seifert and others on um, using uh, an approach called a broad agency announcement that was focused on engaging the private sector in climate smart agriculture. And uh, basically, we're looking to try to, to uh, incentivize the private sector to understand the motivations that private sector would have in, in making uh, investments that are more or less climate smart. Uh, uh, more or less climate friendly, and, and then really looking to um, incentivize additional investments because of that private investment that can be part of a positive feedback loop around climate smart approaches on farm. Now finally, um, looking forward, we have uh, got the framework paper out. I commend it to you all and we'll continue to welcome your comments, you, if you want, you can send them to our Bertram at USA.gov, and, and I'll be responding to those who already did. Um, we are working to integrate climate smart agriculture across the portfolio. It's not like, well, this is our climate smart activity and this isn't. We really don't, we want to think about this holistically across the entire portfolio. It's, uh, we need to think about the, the change, the policy, um, uh, uh, approaches with respect to the context of the um, uh, the executive order on uh, uh, resilience, resilient development, uh, climate resilient development, CRD there. Um, the, I mentioned to you already the GLEE and the Climate Smart courses. Uh, we will work with KDAD and other partners like AgriLinks to to, uh, to share information as we continue to learn. There's a whole lot going on. Um, we will integrate with other investments, and I'm especially excited around understanding climate services and how to really benefit from the investments our climate colleagues are making and, and the in providing farmers with better inform information. We'll take an active role at the, on the global stage because we think we're learning a lot. We want to share it, but we also want to learn from the experience of others. And uh, as, I, as I think we want to do everywhere across Feed the Future is we want to continue that learning. So thanks to all of you for paying attention. Um, I want to say this is the global year of the pulse, the legume crops. We love legumes for many reasons, including the fact that they fix nitrogen and, and add to soil fertility and make what fertilizer we do use far more efficient. They also, of course, provide great income and nutrition for smallholders and cons uh, low-income consumers. So thanks to everyone, and I look forward now to the, a rich discussion.
Well, thank you, Rob. <clears throat> There's been quite an active discussion in the uh, chat box, and thank you, everyone, for um, participating in it and providing your comments and questions as we uh, go through this um, presentation. So now we're going to move on to our um, Q&A, and with that, we'll be we've collected a number of your questions and we'll be answering them uh, now. So <clears throat> with that, the first question we have uh, came from uh, Kenneth, uh, which I don't know if there's anyone particular in the group that would like to answer it. It's uh, in commercial and competitive agricultural markets, how can uh, climate smart agriculture be attractive to the value chain actors in order to better integrate uh, CSA practices into the value chain? Is it attractive to the private sectors? What could be uh, a good strategy to bring value chain actors into CSA products in general? Um, this is Mark Bisaki. Since Kirk isn't here, I'll, I'll answer the question. Um, I'm not an expert on, on, on the, the private sector per se, but uh, there is a lot of great examples where uh, companies and organizations have integrated uh, climate smart practices within their value chains. For example, shade grown, grown coffee is a prime example of how uh, the private sector rewards uh, farmers for uh, producing coffee in a sustainable uh, manner. Cacao is moving more and more towards that. But I think there's ways to integrate it into a lot of different value chains. Um, and it's in the long term investment for for whether it be uh, you know a beer company sourcing uh, grains or a pulse company uh, sourcing um, uh, seeds for the for their for their business as well. Um, there are ways to to integrate CSS CSA into their 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 practices and get rewards back um, through better management of land, more long term. Um, sustainability of their systems. Uh, going on to an earlier question um, from Michael Davidson, uh, most CSA interventions are disadopted. Will we discuss implementation and failures to sustainability uh, implementation uh, methodologies and tools to implement? Uh, Thanks, Zachary. Um, it's a great question, Michael. Um, I think I'm not. Sh I, I guess I'm not sure exactly that I agree with the premise that most are disadopted. We know that there are situations in which complex systems are disadopted, and there's. I think our mission in Zambia is actually looking at some uh, questions around evergreen agriculture, this integration of the legume, uh, leguminous trees into a maize-based system. And, and I, I suspect it's issues of things like labor and profitability. But, you're, but, but the point you make about how can we learn from this, absolutely. That's a case in point that I just mentioned. We need to understand that. Um, but I, I would say overall, we think there's, for every example of where it might not be working, there are, exam there are examples like some of the ones I mentioned where it's, it's for example, in the Indo-Gangetic Plains, that no-till has spread across the region uh, very rapidly. So, so it's uh, you know it's very important that we stay tuned in on this and and try to learn as we go. Maybe, I don't know if anybody else wants to offer a comment. Hi everybody, uh, this is Moffat Gugi. Yeah, I would mention that yeah, there are sort of a lot a lot of good lessons to be learned, and I think. As Rob mentioned, uh, where it has worked, why did it work? And where it's not working, why? I think there's actually a study ongoing at the moment from the Africa Bureau at USAID that's actually trying to uh, sort of unpack this very question so that we can better learn how we incorporate those lessons in terms of uh, people adopting and, and kind of moving with whatever the in uh, innovations are for, for climate smart agriculture. OK, thank you. Um, Moving on to the next question, so we had a number of questions around uh, the maize hybrids that were talked that Rob talked about during the um, presentation. Uh, there was a number of discussions and questions around whether the the hybrids represented uh, GMOs, and then um, are they bounded by commercial binding restrictions? And there were several questions around that and how farmers can actually uh, be able to afford some of those technologies. Great. I'm glad to, that this point was uh, raised. Um, 
They're not GMOs in the, the one of the examples I mentioned. Um, there are, of course, attractive biotech technologies that, that may come down the pike uh, fairly soon around things like drought tolerance and heat tolerance. But what we are using is m modern technology in terms of genetic, uh, using uh, genomics and all to more rapidly be able to select for uh, in increased uh, tolerance to heat or drought. Um, in the case of Africa, there are both hybrids, which are being marketed via small and medium enterprises in the, in the, in the um, private sector to farmers who want hybrids. And then there are what we call open pollinated varieties available as well. And that, that same approach would be true in, Asia, in the Asian context. I believe we have materials that are uh, of both open pollinated and hybrid types. The hybrids, though, are generally preferred if, you know, unless you have a very uh, low risk, a very high risk aversion approach because the potential returns to hybrids are, are so great in terms of productivity. Um, so that's, but that's something that can change over time as people become more familiar and as they, as their risk profile changes based on the, 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 the fact that the technologies are reducing both reducing their risks and increasing their income. Uh, in terms of uh, availability, um, the OPVs would be uh, widely available. Hybrids, I mean, normally one has to pay for hybrid seed, but, but the idea here is that the, that the actual innovation be publicly available. Things that we support with public funds, we always make sure that that technology is widely shared. Uh, so it's a it's a bit of a balancing act, and on the one hand, you partners that want to take the ball and run with it, but also recognizing that that ball has to be available to other partners as well. I would just add to that that um, on the on legumes is a particular um, uh, challenge for us because it's not as attractive to the private sector to market the the legumes, and and many countries do experience uh, uh, shortages or difficulty obtaining uh, some legume seeds. Uh, so that's something I think we need to, to put our head together and really think about how we can uh, better uh, make this a, a system more efficient and more available to. OK, thank you. <clears throat> we have another question from uh, Christy Cook. Uh, experience shows cross-cutting themes such as gender, do not gain any traction without staff, budget, and incentives. What does USAID propose to ensure there is dedicated attention to integrating CSA into agricultural investments? So I'll say, I think this is a, a question. For both the smallholder farmers, but also implementing partners who are carrying out the work. Um, as we talk with folks, it's always, you know, what you do in the field and, and how you design your program, oftentimes very, it goes back to what you're being evaluated on. So I think Feed the Future um, does a good job on this with gender because we have gender as a, as a disaggregate and it's part of our metric system and something that we, we think about regularly because it is a cross-cutting theme and we do um, account for it and so we always have to have that in, in our mind. Um, and then you know, talking with people as we're trying to better understand climate smart agriculture and feed the future, um, it's really apparent that climate and weather have to be addressed in order to meet the top line goals of reducing poverty and improving nutrition. And so, you know, we've noticed that there are a lot of programs and a lot of projects that are already quite climate smart, even though they're not calling it that. And so there are huge opportunities for how we can improve um, climate smart agriculture, but there's a lot going on there because the climate and weather is already part of what people are being evaluated on and the goals that they're trying to address. And we do have work going on now with our M&E team to um, better incorporate the climate smart ag into the attribution metrics that we that we collect every year. And there will be more coming out on that um, soon. Unless, uh, okay. So I'll just leave it at that for now, so I don't talk too long. Thank you for that great question. So I'd like to. Oh. I'd like to add something uh, to that, Laura. This is Rob again. Uh, it's a very important point, and I, I neglected in my talk to mention uh, that Mark Visaki, who is one of our most experienced uh, foreign service agriculturalists who has led Feed the Future portfolios in each of our three main regions, 
is uh, has come into Washington to lead our climate smart team in the in the Bureau of Food Security, and that he has a core group with him in CSI, but also we have people in the uh, research and policy office like Laura. We have um, we have uh, Tatiana in the metrics office. We have Kurt and others in the markets office. So we we are trying to make this uh, uh, you know, as very um, you know really build it in the way we do other things. I would say the additional resource we have is we have strong links to to expertise in other bureaus that are making investments that very much are critical to the kinds of outcomes we're working towards. So. We are uh, attentive to it, uh, and we do have people who have this as their job. So in that respect, it is similar to uh, the, what Christy mentioned on, for example, gender. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, as kind of a follow-up question, we have one um, from uh, Lucy Yakuba, pardon for the mispronunciation. How can uh, CSA be properly captured in m and &E? System. Hi, Jose. This is Tatiana Polito from the Metrics Office. Uh, so that's a that's the question. That's the million dollar question that we're all grappling with right now. But uh, in terms of what we're current or what we're thinking and what we're working towards is being able to, as Rob mentioned, not create a new system but enhance and build off of what we currently have. Uh, also within our monitoring and evaluation and learning. Um, component within Feed the Future. And so it's about really thinking through what our short-term successes look like, which is more around the adaptation and mitigation, uh, uptake of technologies that are climate smart and appropriate, but then also looking at what your long-term uh, goal is, which is really uh, currently uh, making sure that your yields are at least stable or increasing. Uh, despite the, the climate variability that you might see. And so it's really grappling around what is it that we're looking at in, short, in terms of short-term successes, what is it that we're looking in terms of long-term successes, and as, as well as looking in evaluations at, uh, and learning uh, around, uh, as we mentioned earlier, failures, uh, successes uh, within you know, the context of, of the example that we gave about Zambia, uh, and trying to understand a little bit more the nuance around what are the impediments, what are the biggest challenges, and how are we actually overcoming these challenges and seeing if there's anything that could actually be scaled up. Uh, so there's a lot of moving components, but I think crit uh, critically right now what we're looking at is enhancing the system that we have uh, as opposed to trying to build something completely different, which would just be onerous, uh, especially to all of us who are uh, within uh, government who already have a lot of... Uh, um, stakeholders interested in what we do. <laughs> and this is Laura again. I just wanted to add in, Tatiana, that was a great explanation. Um, I wanted to add in that it, it's tricky, right? Because Climate Smart Egg isn't just a list of practices or technologies, it's very context specific. And so, you know, before you can figure out if you're doing something that's climate smart, you first have to identify what problem are you addressing. And that, that differs depending on the time frame that you're interested in and the um, and and where you are, you know, if you're what what that climate variability will be like. So it's 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 not an, an easy process, but we're working on it. Thank you, Laura and Tatiana. Um, we have another question from uh, McDonald Homer on advancing uh, the discussion and thinking around climate smart agriculture within non feed the future countries and what we might be doing about that. Uh, thanks, Zachary. Uh, well, it's a great question, Mac, and I, um, I as at the outset, you know, I, I mentioned that we feel that what we're learning and what we're doing is relevant, of course, beyond just Feed the Future. That's especially true in, 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 I think, with respect to USAID. You know, we are working with technologies in South and Central Asia in our focus countries that are wholly relevant and connected to the... Um, the interests of the programs in important uh, missions like Islamabad or Kabul or, or, or um, others in Central Asia. Uh, so we want to try to work as an agency in this regard. We don't we don't draw a line between FTF and agriculture across uh, across the agency. And um, we are, for example, I think as you know, we're we're 
working with your mission now to think about how to leverage some of the learning. And I really welcome anybody in any of our missions, but particularly those outside the focus countries, to share their ideas for how we can be most effective in sharing the kind of learning that, uh, the knowledge that we're working here with AgriLinks and KDAT on to um, uh, missions more broadly. And so we welcome, we welcome your thoughts on that, but it's uh, certainly a priority for us. So another question is uh, talking about risk and how do we, you know, help farmers to, you know, overcome their um, more risk averse, uh, act, you know, inclinations when it comes to these new technologies and how to help them uh, adopt those uh, new technologies that are part of this uh, new approach uh, and how do you deal with those kind of uh, uh, expenses? May I, um, Zachary, on this? This is a sure. really important point uh, that Mark makes here. Um, at the outset, I think I commented about how much of the response to the paper we got back were people citing just this, you know, that it was really farmers that are the ultimate decision makers. And I hope that um, I tried to convey the fact that, you know, we're not prescriptive. We do not decide uh, what farmers do. And, and, and especially on these complex things, and we saw this already with respect to the uh, disadoption issue, um, it's farmers make decisions, whatever is best for them, for many reasons. But I think what we are trying to do, Mark, is provide better information or more information and better, more choices. Um, so those things we can do. What we want to learn is how they use that. So that, I mean, part of Farmer experimentation is hugely important in terms of what to do or not to do, and we've seen that in the South Asian context, and we're seeing it in the Af Sub-Saharan African context and in Latin America. So um, I guess I, I hope we're approaching this in a way that respects the fact that it's farmers who ultimately decide. Uh, some of these things, the jury's still out. On the other hand, as I mentioned, there are some of these things that have been widely adopted by millions of smallholders. So. So it's, a, it's an ongoing process, and in this respect, it doesn't really differ from other um, uh, kinds of agricultural innovation and transformation, except with the fact that, in, to some degree, if we're trying to anticipate situations, I think that becomes very challenging because farmers are going to, they're going to make decisions based on their ultimate reality that they, they deal with on the ground. Um, it, what we can try to do is build in approaches that serve their needs now, but also position them to be more resilient in the future. But you're absolutely right. It's they that decide what they're going to do. I would add to that, uh, that dealing, you know, my experience across Asia, Africa, and Latin America with smallholders are, they're all very, very similar. And uh, they actually have a lot more in common than they do uh, not in common. So I think that finding solution, and here's the challenge up to all of you, is we need to find solutions that work for farmers. Credit systems, that the way they're set up, many of them are not really, really all that advantageous for a farmer because they have to, they, they borrow the money to buy seeds or fertilizer, and they're expected to start paying it back right away. Well, how is that, that possible when you have to wait four or five months for a crop to mature and, and, and harvest and, and, and sell it? Um, uh, there are innovative models out there that are, are that are people trying. The One Acre Fund, in particular, visited us last week, and they talked about um, when they give out a loan to a farmer, they can pay back that loan when they choose to at any time um, from the planting to, to post-harvest. Um, and that gave them a little more flexibility. Now, that wasn't very convenient for the One Acre Fund because they said it's very nerve-wracking because we don't know when the people are going to pay it but they're still getting repayments of 98%. So, you know, I challenge you guys to think of ways to make this adoptable by smallholders. And a lot of times that means sitting down with the smallholder and really looking at their situation, understanding their situation and getting their feedback on how things work. And then going back to the private sector, then going back to other donors and really trying to come up with a product that is most applicable to them. Thank you, Mark and Rob. 
Uh, so the next question we have uh, revolves around uh, fisheries and uh, fishing. So Luis Ramos had asked a couple of questions along this line, and it's uh, how is fishing seen by Feed the Future as practices to increase food availability and nutrition as uh, climate-adapted practices? Um, I, I can take a, uh, make a comment about that, but I invite colleagues to as well. Um, we do have several Feed the Future missions working with small-scale artisanal fisheries. Um, and of course, they're, these are located in coastal zones where climate issues are, are very important, environmental issues generally are important. And uh, I, my sense is that the focus there is trying to sustainably manage the resource in ways that preserve its productivity, preserve the bio, biodiversity, but also enhance the livelihoods of those communities and, and individual uh, fisher uh, families. Um, we do have a lot of work at the same time on aquaculture. I think that's not the focus of the question, but um, there is a certain connectedness between um, aquaculture and fisheries because together they satisfy the market demand uh, for fish. We are also taking steps to uh, really generate, I think, climate smart and biodiversity smart fish feeds by trying to shift from fish meal products that are based on often non-sustainable practices of, of, uh, of wild fish stocks being harvested uh, to uh, other sources of protein, in particular soy, which of course is, is can be a very climate friendly crop in terms of its nitrogen fixation and um, generation of, of, of protein that can, uh, as we talked about earlier, increase the feed efficiency and hence the climate smartness of, of animal based systems. So, um, I, what I will tell you also, though, is that we are talking with our colleagues in the E3 Bureau, in the biodiversity group about fisheries and thinking more about what opportunities there are there for science, the kind of investments that we tend to make in the Central Bureau to link together with their objectives around preserving fish biodiversity in ways that will perhaps, uh, Luis, increase our uh, engagement in fisheries going forward. But um, we'll, we'll continue to welcome ideas and suggestions in that regard. And as well, so as Rob mentioned, yeah, so look forward actually to an AgriLinks event. We've been talking about this for a while on exactly how we are sort of incorporating fisheries uh, into uh, a lot of our feed the future and food security efforts. We, we, I would like to mention too though, that um, the question particularly on provision of protein and uh, micronutrients is, is very, very important. And one of our key goals under Feed the Future is of course addressing malnutrition and poverty in general. But I think the idea of both collecting evidence for how that supports our key goal, but also the implementation side are critical. So in Senegal, in Ghana, in Cambodia, these are places where we are actually working uh, to think about how both artisanal fishing, but also just uh, fisheries in general can, can contribute to our sort of top line goals. And um, the work we are doing here with um, sort of our central e efforts in, in, in Washington, the, uh, within the Bureau for Food Security, our nutritionists, as well as uh, folks working in the bio uh, forestry and biodiversity office, uh, uh, forestry and biodiversity uh, office in E3, is, is actually critical to, the, to, to sort of the, the outcomes we might, we might see on this. So please watch for, for that one AgriLinks event coming up. Thomas uh, Hurley. How can USAID get missions in line with uh, this mix, mixed farming approach, combining crops, animals, and aquaculture? He's noting that uh, USAID Bangladesh had just issued an RFA that prohibits uh, including aquaculture in the project plan. So um, thanks. I'm going to take a stab at this, but I'm sure uh, maybe Mark will add, add a perspective too, having had more experience being in a mission uh, that Washington tries to keep in line. Um, anyway, I'm joking. Uh, we really don't look at that relationship that way, but we do we do look at it as an opportunity for active dialogue. I'm going to make a guess here that the example from Bangladesh reflects the fact that the mission has separate major fish 
aquaculture oriented activities, some of which are in the same systems. So I suspect that's an artifact of how their budget is made up. Um, there's a larger issue, though, and, and your question gets at it, Tom, and that is that um, the value chain approach, which has been very, it's very, very helpful in terms of, you know, building in that uh, market linkage for smallholders to help achieve the the everything. I mean, but particularly the economic sustainability of, of our investments. Um, having said that, we know that these value chains don't exist in isolation, and we're trying to think about how, what kinds of opportunities farmers have looking at their entire system, and so hence our some of our scaling work offers. Uh, a focus on legumes to complement a value chain in cereals where there's a rotation, other opportunities uh, around uh, bringing in horticulture in a system uh, that might be uh, legume focused in terms of the value chain. Uh, so there are um, approaches on that. Um, I think mission missions are trying to balance this issue of focus on the one hand, which has been always a, a top priority in, in Feed the Future, with a, you know, a, a holistic approach that looks at the, as the, at the farming household and the, the various decisions they make. So I, I think there's always going to be a, a bit of a, a tension there, but uh, hopefully we can um, continue to learn and, and, and try to get it right and, again, enable new possibilities for bottom-up decision making by farmers that um, allows them to 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 uh, access the kinds of information or technologies that they wish. But Mark, do you want to add anything to that? Having been on the mission yeah. side, Thomas, I, I would just I know Bangladesh is off the line today because I've seen it. Bangladesh and maybe German type question. Um, I I would get in touch with them directly, but. Having designed the original FTF uh, strategy in, in, in Bangladesh um, and, and, and a couple other places as well, is that we always leave enough flexibility to the design so that things can be added later on. I mean, I, th I don't think we're arrogant in, um, to say that we know have all the answers when we write these things. And uh, things change on the ground. Things don't work out the way we thought they work out. So the flexibility has to be built into that. And, and maybe they now have enough uh, uh, aquaculture uh, type of activities going on that they would rather concentrate on a few things. And, and, and Rob is perfectly right is that um, we may have in the beginning concentrated on uh, single uh, value chains and didn't think about the off-season value chains uh, that those, those farmers are integrated in. And in, I know in Guatemala, we are very focused on exports of, of non-traditional horticulture crops to the U.S., but that market is only open for four months out of the year. You know, so what do you do with the land uh, for the rest of the year? And, and, and growing more horticulture uh, crops was not the answer because there was no market for them out on the off-season. So there was a perfect opportunity to, to integrate uh, maize and beans and work on those crops that were very important to them as well. Um, and uh, it didn't detract at all from our value chain work. So I think that there are, are ways to incorporate a, a lot of uh, CSA into your, your, your design that actually really will uh, enhance what you're really trying to accomplish with the value chains. Thanks, Mark and Rob. Uh, we've got a question from Amanda Davey uh, asking for what is an example of a practice, uh, CSA practice, that has been adopted by millions of smallholder farmers? Well, I think especially the use of the word uh, millions points us towards the Indo-Gangetic plane where we have literally millions and millions of smallholder farmers. And what we do see is this shift towards uh, reduced tillage or no-till being widely adopted across that region, and it's as I talked about in the in the slides set that, that it's really a very climate smart but also profit increasing approach because you're using less energy, you're using less water, uh, but you're getting um, even higher levels of productivity and um, considerable increases. 
um, in 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 terms of um, things like soil organic matter. The um, the other thing that I would say that is less of a practice than a technology. I mean, less of a technology, more of a technology than a practice. Excuse me, is this issue of of climate resilient seeds? And we we have, for example, the flood tolerant rices being uh, 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 adopted in in parts of South Asia. I'm not sure we're in the millions yet, but we're 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 aiming that direction. The as I pointed out, the drought tolerant maize has been widely widely adopted. There's still a long way to go, but uh, I think as these these materials get better and better relative to the farmer varieties, hopefully that pace will accelerate. But um, you know, this is something that. Again, it's uh, the information piece we hope will be uh, really useful in this. Things like uh, cell phone penetration to communities. There's lots of ways now that we can be more efficient in, in, in getting information to smallholders. I think uh, Mofat. Yeah, I can, I can give another example uh, quick. I, I don't know whether we're into millions of farmers or pastoralists, but um, looking at the farmer managed natural regeneration, we are talking about millions of acres and, and hectares in Niger, all, all across the Sahel. And I think, as I've seen, uh, I think it's Torsten Mandel on the, on the chat box. He mentions a lot about sort of incorporation of agroforestry practices. That's something that is really widespread uh, across Eastern Southern Africa and also in, in, um, uh, in, in West Africa. So this, this is an approach sort of that incorporates uh, uh, sort of perennial plants or, or tree species uh, that support both uh, sort of some food needs, but also some other environmental benefits that we can we can talk about. So that's also another uh, example: farmer managed natural regeneration. Okay, thank you, Mofat and Rob. Uh, so we've got a question from David Rohrbach. Um, given the lack of good data on adoption and disadoption for many technologies, especially in Africa, is there not a need to a invest more in M and E and b do this differently than we have in the past, i.e. less justification of past investment and more efforts to better understand partial success and failure. Sure. Hi, David. This is Tatiana again. I'm never going to say no to more money for monitoring and evaluation and learning, so I'm with you right there. Um, in the future, we have made um, a commitment to spend uh, at least 10% of funding that is received, uh, well, actually as an agency, really, 10% of all funding received either at an operating unit, so at a mission, um, or at a central bureau on monitoring and evaluation. Uh, and so <clears throat> here that means that we have a rather robust um, emphasis on monitoring and evaluation. Uh, and we, we utilize that to not only, as you say, um, just kind of be the bean counters, but also really think about improving the quality uh, and the frequency of the data that we are collecting. Um, <clears throat> so in addition to uh, getting information on adoption or disadoption of many technologies, we're also looking at learning, as you say, um, from our past investments. And to that end, we also spend about 3% of our budget on both impact and performance evaluations to basically get at this whole question of why did we succeed, why did we fail, is there any commonality, uh, commonalities and lessons that we have learned here that we can apply going forward and really build and improve our future uh, designs to uh, ensure that <clears throat> adoptions uh, or uh, I guess dissemination of new technologies are um, achieving the success that that they should be. Uh, I don't know if anybody else wanted to add a little bit more about that. I can, this is Laura again, I can speak from the scaling team perspective and there are a number of case studies going on right now uh, through MSI. Um, and so they're looking at this idea of, of adoption, but not just through direct beneficiaries. In Feed the Future, we're very interested in indirect beneficiaries. And I saw a comment from Farzana on here as well, so that's that's great, um, in Bangladesh. So, you know, if we're going to have population-level impacts, we need things to scale and not just reach the people that we're doing incremental programming for and counting as actually working with on a one-on-one -on -one basis through implementing partners, but how we're setting up systems systems um, so the indirect beneficiaries are, can also um, be impacted. So we have, there are some case studies going on right now, and those, those should soon be available. 
use this opportunity to, to plug three things that we've also done, because it's also a question, as I said, and as David mentions, about the quality of, of data that we receive. And so we have, um, meaning the metrics team here uh, in the Bureau for Food Security, have developed more information that you probably are care to, to know about, but on how to uh, field surveys, popular uh, any uh, beneficiary-based surveys. Um, that just recently came out. Uh, we have also uh, done a synthesis report on uh, the, I think it's over 100 and some odd, 194 evaluations in food security, try to get some of these bigger lessons learned, as we've mentioned. Um, and then we've also done um, specifically a, a guide for uh, our missions that's all available in AgriLinks, but it's on how to collect data on adoption, um, counting hectares, all of these questions that you that, that implementers or people who are trying to use these indicators might have about you know, measuring the quality and and um, just getting these, these data points that sometimes can be very difficult when you're talking about a very small um, area, uh, be it Hector or a district that you're working with or a small population of people. And I'll take also an opportunity to follow up. There's a question by uh, Z. Rahim uh, around plans for upcoming FTF projects to require CSA indicators. We are, uh, as an agency, really going through through uh, an, an indicator redesign process, so not just within the initiative, uh, but also within USAID itself, uh, to really take a hard look at the indicators that we are using to collect this information. Um, and so there are some changes underway um, that'll probably uh, <clears throat> be finalized and made publicly available sometime in summer of 2016. Uh, and those would be applied um, basically start uh, the planification in 2016, and then we would have initial results probably a year from now, since it takes a while for systems to, to come into play. Um, but in terms of requiring CS CSA-specific indicators, um, like Rob and others have mentioned, it's not about stovepiping, uh, also within um, monitoring and evaluation. And so there are indicators currently that we would consider required if applicable um, about adoption, about um, pr um, productivity and production uh, that missions are already using. And so it is about, again, enhancing what it is that we do have and what we currently collect, um, as well as getting a better awareness of how um, uh, how climate and climate information is really um, being built into the project design of activities. And so it's a process. Um, so it wouldn't be new indicators. It would be using what we already have and maybe getting a little bit more information about what about that uh, uptake was really influenced uh, by uh, a lot of the, this uh, new information around climate safe agriculture. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, Next question from uh, Naomi uh, Sakane. Uh, climate smart agriculture builds on the use of sound climate data and science. Unfortunately, data availability and quality on the ground remain questionable. Uh, how do you uh, plan to address this great challenge? Thoughts? It's a very important question. Um, I, as I said, um, we very much want to draw the best of what climate science and information we have to understand vulnerability assessments, their, their utility, but also their limitations, and to uh, enhance information opportunities for farmers uh, such that uh, they can, their decisions can be uh, in their better interest and in, in the, the towards their being able to withstand uh, unexpected uh, variability uh, or unpredictable uh, kinds of events. Um, but having said that, we do recognize the limitations, the fact that we don't have good data in a lot of situations. Um, but progress is being made. There is a lot of investment going on in terms of things like forecasting and so forth. Um, but we do, we do recognize for example, we can look at trends. 
So we know, for example, in a lot of situations that we work in that temperatures are higher than they used to be, that rainfall is less predictable, less seasonal in terms of its uh, uh, reliability. So there are things that even if we lack perfect information, we can start to take steps that help uh, anticipate at least you know the climate farmers have now, which is frankly what farmers will be most interested in addressing. Um, as I said, we there's other ways we can try to build in that long-term resilience in ways that are, are fully consistent with meeting their near-term needs. But it's a gap. I absolutely agree. And uh, but there's a lot of bright people in USAID and elsewhere uh, on the climate side of the agency that are really thinking about how to how to enhance that level of information uh, in the developing country context. I'll just chime in and say that yeah, the Global Climate Change Initiative does a lot of work with climate information um, and climate databases, uh, and we then try to tap into that uh, to those projects and to those efforts. Um, and I think the point about you know there isn't that much data or good quality data is really important too because we try to then convey a message about people having to be smart consumers of the information. So just because it's available, you know where is it in sort of this pipeline of of doing research and then rolling it out and being ready to scale up. So th those investments are totally needed, but we always have to think about where they are um, as far as needing more money for the research side and the development side versus being ready to really be super impactful and useful for the smallholder farmers. And I'll quickly, uh, Ms. Moffat, uh, I'll quickly mention sort of the use of uh, geospatial tools as well as, as a sort of a key agency priority and a, really a whole of government effort in terms of thinking about using remotely sensed data to re and crowdsourcing all kinds of information from really remote places as another key source of important information. Thank you. Um, we're getting close to the end of time, so I'll wrap up with uh, one final kind of combined question. Uh, this is coming from Al Hassan uh, Tempuri and also kind of combined with uh, Faustine Fabwar. Uh, what is Feed the Future doing to integrate uh, CSA into policy development in countries, regions, and communities, uh, government uh, investments in agriculture and agribusiness? And sort of tied to this as part of uh, Faustine's uh, question is, how is the how are we using or leveraging the uh, Paris Agreement to provide momentum for uh, CSA-related operations? Well, I'll take a crack at it, but I welcome my colleagues to, to come in as well. Uh, you know, we have this um, not a dilemma, but it's a, a challenge, an interesting one. We want to be country-led, as I said. In other words, we'd like to follow the lead of our country partners, in part because if they don't prioritize something, it's probably not worth our trying to do it either. Um, so on one hand, it's, it's, there's an aspect of following and supporting. On the other hand, we engage in the dialogue in all kinds of uh, global and regional organizations in which partner countries are present. A lot of the international organizations like FAO, like EFAD, and others are 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 working with governments in ways that raise awareness around climate smart agriculture. Uh, we have the Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture. So there's, there's, I don't think there's one prescriptive approach here, but um, hopefully as part of a, a holistic discussion of food security and agriculture, we will find ways to, to certainly share the degree to which climate adaptation and mitigation potential is affecting our thinking. Um, partners will do the same. And of course, there's many advocates within our partner countries and in regional organizations like ECOWAS or COMESA, uh, other regional organizations in, in other parts of the world that are thinking about these. So I think it's a gradual process, um, not, not something that uh, you know we flip the switch on, but um, I, I, I believe this issue is here to stay, and as as going forward, um, it will be mainstreamed in ways that really um, include that policy dimension. Because obviously, you know, development assistance is a shrinking piece of the overall investment in agriculture. 
the biggest parts of it are investments from our partner countries themselves and investments from the private sector. They really dwarf the kinds of investments that we make. So that policy piece that the questioner mentions is critical. I mean, because that's where you go beyond what you do with your own money, but you're trying to be part of a dialogue that influences other investors, public and private, as well. I just add that I think that we'll be having a lot of these conversations in our mission um, coming up because I think the I, INDCs um, will be brought into this, this whole discussion um, forum um, in your respected countries. It, as well, it, it is a big it's a big item on the CADAP and NEPA uh, African um, agenda as well. So I, I think a, we will uh, have to integrate um, with the country's priorities in order for this to work as well. Just so everybody knows, INDCs, which are now, I think, NDCs, the Nationally Determined Contributions as a result of the Paris COP. So yeah, great point, Mark. Well, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us for this webinar today and for all your comments and uh, discussions and questions. Uh, we really appreciate it. We hope you have found this useful. Um, thank you to uh, Rob for giving such an excellent presentation. And thank you to our experts for joining us from uh, Laura, uh, Mark, Bofat, and Tatiana. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, as always, uh, this presentation has been recorded. Uh, when we make it available, it'll be up on AgriLinks on the event page. Uh, you will also be able to get the um, paper and um, slide deck from there as well. Uh, if you have um, questions or comments, please uh, direct them to you know, AgriLinks off of the, the website there. Uh, we have uh, a feedback um, polls up, so if you can take a moment before you um, drop off to and head on to the rest of your day to uh, you know, answer the polls, and we'd appreciate your uh, feedback. With that, I say thank you, and have an excellent rest of your day, or you know, good night, good evening to you <laughs> as well, uh, and we'll see you in the future. Thank you.